level. Now, I have to say that uh, last Wednesday morning, my son came down to breakfast and asked me why, when he had taken a quick look at Wikipedia that morning, this is what he saw. Now, it turns out a lot of people saw that. About 162 million people uh, visited this Wikipedia page last Wednesday uh, as part of the internet-wide protest on SOPA. And what that, I think, has created is much what we're having today, a discussion about copyright in a way that, frankly, when we started to think even about this program, would have been scarcely imaginable. Uh, I arrived in Tampa last night and went to the, the car rental um, and the agent there asked what I was going to be doing, and I said I, I was a law professor and I was giving a, a talk here about copyright, and she said, well, I, I don't really know anything about copyright. I said, well, you know, it's about, about the internet technology and how copyright um, affects some of that stuff. And she said, oh, oh, you mean that protest on the internet last week? Uh, this has generated such widespread interest in this issue and discussion that, as I say, uh, few would have ever believed possible. But I want to start, before I get into SOPA-related issues, I actually want to talk about what happened just yesterday rather than what happened a week ago. This was the streets of Warsaw yesterday, where thousands of people uh, took to the streets to protest the fact that the Polish government, along with a series of other governments, were signing the anti-counterfeiting trade agreement. Now, the notion that this is what would happen, those were the streets, these were the politicians uh, bearing Guy Fawkes ma masks in Parliament on the opposition party to protest the decision to go ahead and sign the anti-counterfeiting trade agreement. I'm going to talk a bit about ACTA in a few minutes. But this is an issue, I think, quite clearly that has extended well beyond the halls of academe, the halls of um, the, the offices in Hollywood and the like, and has become mainstream in a serious way, uh, and in a way be being driven by what's taking place internationally. Now, some are characterizing this, and they characterized what we saw take place at SOPA as being somehow Hollywood versus Silicon Valley. Other, others talk about it as somehow being the old versus the new. Uh, I don't think it's really about either of those things. I don't think it's, it's actually about an either or. I think what we're seeing take place are really two things. One is the disruptions that are being caused by the internet, not exclusively about copyright, but even more about the way that people can engage and in many ways ensure that their voices are heard when it comes to any number of different po political issues, and digital rights issues resonate particularly strongly uh, with those who are online. And at the same time, the other element that's taking place here is the evolution of international copyright, which over the years, as, you, as you're about to hear, has shifted in some ways away from Geneva into back rooms and into places where the many people who are affected by what takes place are frequently not invited and in many instances not even uh, aware of what's taking place. So that's where I want to go. And I want to start, though, with SOPA or PIPA as the, the other piece of legislation and not spend a lot of time talking about it, but only for those that, that aren't familiar with these issues. There is, of course, that pirate element. And, uh, <laughs> and so here, and so this is the, the Pirate Bay. And the Pirate Bay would be, I think, in many ways, the poster child for why SOPA uh, and PIPA exists or why there was an attempt to bring it forward, at least though the proponents of it would argue this is precisely what they have in mind. And their argument was that U.S. law can be used to deal with pirate bays were they to exist in the United States. And frankly, some still do, but nevertheless, the notion was you could target those sites if they exist in the United States. The challenge is everywhere else. What happens for the many websites that are located outside the jurisdiction of the United States? How can those sites be targeted if they are engaging in active copyright infringement? And so the solution that was proposed in SOPA versus PIPA takes us well beyond traditional notions of copyright. It seeks to target a whole series of different intermediaries, with the idea being that if you can target some of those intermediaries, they might be in a position to stop some of this infringing activity from taking place. So as one example, and one that caused an enormous amount of concern within the internet technological community, is that you can target the domain name system itself. The US takes a very aggressive approach when it comes to its jurisdictional questions around the internet, arguing that any domain name that is registered here, uh, whether by the individual or the registry itself that runs the domain name, the .coms, the .net, the .orgs, they are all subject to US jurisdiction, which means that roughly 80% or more of the world's domains 
uh, are all under that theory subject to U.S. courts and U.S. jurisdiction, which will be news to the millions of people outside the United States who may have registered these domain names and don't really think that they ought to be subject to U.S. jurisdiction. So the view was in SOPA, one way to target this was to actually change where someone's domain name gets pointed to, require ISPs either to block access to websites or make changes uh, within the DNS itself, within the domain name system itself, to stop access, raising in the view of many security experts enormous concerns about the implications of doing something like that. There was also targeting a range of different other intermediaries, payment intermediaries, for example, like Visa and MasterCard, who might be supplying payment services to some of these websites could be forced to ensure that they, to stop providing those services. Ad networks that might provide advertising to these sites could be told you aren't permitted to advertise or allow advertisements on these sites. So essentially try to choke off some of their access. There was even the notion, a new notion of circumvention technology. In this case, there was a recognition that even if there was an attempt to block access to various sites, that there would be technologies out there that people could use to get around those internet service provider blockings. Now, those are the same technologies that we actively promote in countries like China and elsewhere to try to ensure that people can get around things like the Great Chinese Firewall. But the notion in SOPA was that if those technologies were used to try to get around blocking sites that were said to have infringed on copyright, then we ought to stop being able to, we've got to stop people having access to those very kinds of technologies. Putting at, at, at odds the notion of an open and free internet which we seek to promote in countries around the world. We do it in Canada, you do it, of course, in the United States, uh, and at the same time concerns about what it meant for copyright infringement. And so the result, of course, well, this was SOPA, and the result was this uh, really unprecedented um, protest, at least in terms of size, although not unprecedented in terms of engaging in these kinds of protests. As I mentioned on Wikipedia, which was not the originator of this, it was actually the site Reddit that got things going, but it was Wikipedia that I think captured the attention of many. 162 million visits, uh, 8 million of those people taking the time to look up their elected representative um, at the time, uh, which is, of course, why you start to see some real impact there. Google had a petition on their site, which 7 million people signed. There was one site that was actually fostering the ability to make a phone call with your elected representative. They were averaging 2,000 calls a second. Um, and so the impact was rather remarkable. Now, we saw this blackout protest over those 24 hours in sites all across the Internet, news sites engaging in the same sort of thing. Uh, this was Boing Boing site, saying, and a popular blog saying the same sorts of stuff. So thousands of sites participating, and it wasn't just in the United States. Many other, many other people around the world recognizing that the legislation within SOPA would have affected them as well. In fact, by design, it was designed in many ways to affect not just companies in the United States, but websites and individuals around the world. And so this is the Huffington Post, a U.S. site, but this is their Canadian version, uh, which actually went black uh, at a time when the U.S. version didn't. Uh, this is a New Zealand site um, saying much the same sort of thing. And so the protest was incredibly widespread, and the impact was, as I'm sure many people here know, incredibly dramatic. This from ProPublica highlights where the support, the supporters within the U.S., within the Congress, on January 18th, the day of the protest, and you could see at the time there were 80 supporters and 31 opponents, at least on record. A day later, that had reversed dramatically. 65 uh, supporters, so the supporters had begun to drain away, uh, and 101 opponents. And of course, within 48 hours later, uh, both bills were by and large dead, at least for now. Um, as the, those behind the bills recognized that support had literally evaporated almost overnight, or at least within three nights, uh, in the face of this incredible protest. Now, it's worth noting that this is a big part of an even bigger story. Um, sometimes we say a small part of a big story. This is, a, this is clearly a big story. Um, but it is part of something that is even bigger taking place in the context of protest, even around this particular issue. In fact, the, the notion of using a web blackout didn't originate with this. Um, there was even attempts to do it in the United States back in the mid-1990s with the Communications Decency Act. But one of the first truly effective instances of this took place in New Zealand, where there was legislation scheduled to take effect that would have created what's known as a three strikes and you're out system, three allegations of infringement, uh, and a person could lose access to the internet. Their internet service provider would be required to terminate their access uh, this was a campaign described as guilt by accusation. 
Uh, and so a number of sites actually was an artist's group that started the protest, encouraging people either to black out their site or just black out the picture on their Twitter profile or on their Facebook profile. And this took hold throughout New Zealand. It's a, a smaller country. You don't need as many people act active, but once you start getting a number of people doing so, the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who did this began to attract attention, and the government withdrew the legislation uh, once this began to take hold. Now, they brought it back, much like SOPA will in some incarnation come back as well. Uh, but it comes back uh, in a far, it came back in a far better format than was initially planned. In fact, it's not even the first Wikipedia-based blackout. There was one of those in Italy just last year, uh, as there was legislation being planned in Italy. And so the Italian Wikipedia redirected all Italian Wikipedia entries to a particular page designed to educate those uh, that were accessing the site about what was taking place. The one other, uh, the, the, in Europe, not just Wikipedia blocking, but other activities as well, of course, there's the emergence of political parties concerned specifically with these issues, the Pirate Party. Um, pirates come up again. Um, in, in Europe, uh, where we see in Germany capturing a whole number of seats in Berlin elections, in fact, there are even now two members of the Pirate Party who are members of the European Parliament. Uh, and so there has been real success uh, in taking this and turning it into uh, a mainstream political issue uh, in many places. Now, the place where I know that I know best when it comes to these sorts of issues is actually my own country, Canada. And so I can't help but tell you our story, um, which is a little bit my story as well, when it comes to leveraging the internet and new technologies to engage in the same kinds of uh, activities. And so in the Canadian context, it wasn't a, a web blackout, but instead it was this, a Facebook page. Uh, which today, I must admit, seems a bit mundane when you've got 800 million or so users on Facebook, and the notion of using that to rally people uh, around these issues is, is pretty widespread. Um, but back in 2007, it was somewhat less so. Um, and so it was in December of 2007 that my government, the Canadian government, had planned to introduce new legislation, uh, and every sense from various sources was that it wasn't going to be the kind of balanced legislation that I think most Canadians were looking for. It was legislation that we were being significantly pressured by the United States and I suppose by some other countries to try to enact. Uh, and so what I did one Saturday night after I'm a, a, a hockey fan, a Toronto Maple Leafs fan as it happens, uh, after they had lost yet again, they're not a very good team. Uh, it's a bit frustrating, I have to say, for Toronto Maple Leaf fans to know that the Tampa Bay Lightning have actually won the Stanley Cup in my lifetime. Um, <laughs> Whereas Toronto Maple Leafs, one of the original teams, still have not done so since I've been alive. But anyway, that's, that's just sort of an aside. Uh, in any event, uh, this was a Saturday night. The Leafs had lost yet again. The legislation was about to, we knew it was about to be introduced several days later. And so I started up this Facebook page uh, called Fair Copyright for Canada. And I just sent it out to a few of my Facebook friends, uh, which is, as people know, it's your friends plus a few people you know on Facebook. Uh, and what I did, and, and so I sent it out and encouraged them to, to join if they like, because this seemed like a natural for people who wanted to learn more about this legislation and about the kinds of things they might be able to do about it. Um, and uh, I looked on the Sunday and the Monday as first 10, then 50, then 100, and then 1,000, and then 2,000, uh, about growing at several thousand a day to the point that this site grew to over 90,000 people at one point in time, and the government that had been scheduled to introduce the legislation didn't. Now, or at least delayed it for by six months. Now, this grew in many different ways. It grew from uh, web-based protests stoking the fires, first to trade press, which began to, to pay attention both to this grassroots advocacy and the concerns about where things were going. Then the national press began to pick up on the story as well. In fact, uh, one of our, our so-called national paper, the Canadian equivalent, I suppose, of the New York Times, uh, if that's national, can, the Global Mail is even more national, had two headlines during this time that, frankly, many of us thought we'd, we'd never see. The first at the bottom there, Ottawa accused of caving into Hollywood on copyright, uh, appeared on the front page of the Globe one Saturday morning. It, it, it may have been a slow news day but it was still rather remarkable to see that take place. And I should note that that came actually directly out of a Canadian Library Association uh, event that they held on Parliament Hill as librarians were speaking out and ensured that uh, politicians began to take notice. Uh, the other headline, one that, as I like to say, I still can't quite convince my kids of, uh, how did copyright become cool? Uh, 
because it seemed at least for a brief period of time that somehow copyright was cool, that people were talking about it. I suppose in the same way that, that people have begun talking about copyright uh, over the last number of days in light of what we see take place on SOPA. And it wasn't just online, we saw it in print, we saw it uh, uh, in broadcast as well. In fact, it also had an offline component where the responsible minister uh, the fellow there at the bottom by the name of Jim Prentice happened to be holding a holiday party for his constituents. Uh, he's a member of parliament in Calgary, Alberta, the west coast of the country. And so myself and a number of other people said that if you happen to be in the area, you might want to drop by. Uh, <laughs> now, it, now, note that all of this took place at a time where the bill still hadn't been introduced. It was only based on what we, well, what we knew was coming, but some amount of speculation, but it was, uh, it's indicative of the kind of concern that existed, that uh, I think it was 50 or 60 people showed up to his office, some driving from Edmonton to Calgary, it's about a three hour drive, uh, just for two minutes with the minister to express their concern about legislation that, as I say, hadn't even been introduced yet. In fact, what we saw take place six months later when the bill that was delayed ultimately came out showed again the, the power that the internet has to to rally and try to influence policy. So you had groups leveraging the internet that in a previous time would have required real physical resources or real physical space, now simply using the internet to try to bring people together such that tens of thousands of people when this bill was introduced in June of 2008 took the time to write their elected representatives. Those Facebook groups that started with that group that I referenced a moment ago on a national level began to emerge as local chapters. And so we had more than 20 local chapters in cities and communities across the country who not knowing one another but having simply the same kind of interest in these issues began to self-organize, began to create their own pages. Sometimes it was through Facebook, other times here you can see in Montreal they created a wiki-based page talking about who their local elected representatives were, about what the bill would mean. Here's the Vancouver group doing much the same thing. I always find it quite remarkable that, that, I, that I see that here they had for one particular meeting an agenda set out. They'd found a local community space where they could hold the event. Someone would take minutes. This is the sort of thing that you expect from uh, established organizations. This is not an established organization. It's a bunch of people who found one another on Facebook and were concerned about copyright and were using these technologies to uh, organize in, I think, some pretty dramatic ways started engaging in what some people describe as web, using Web 2.0 type tools. This was a Google map where we tried to track uh, press coverage of the bill, uh, with the idea being that you can't quite see it, but red, the, the red, red uh, pricks there uh, all happened to be negative coverage. The yellow was uh, the sort, of, sort of yellow, mustardy looking, I suppose, was neutral and blue was positive. And so that the press coverage in light of many of these protests was very negative on this legislation. And anyone could actually click and take a look at the uh, underlying articles and judge for themselves. We used Google Calendar to identify when local, these local chapter meetings were taking place so people would know what's happening where. There was even fair copyright for Canada swag. <laughs> so we used Cafe Press so that you could get t-shirts and mugs. Uh, and I have to admit, I got a whole bunch of it, but my wife never lets me wear any of it. Uh, but nevertheless, it was still kind of neat to be able to pull that together and actually donate some of the proceeds to Creative Commons that, that Kenny was mentioning earlier. Um, we even had a YouTube contest where the, people, the bill was known as Bill C-61, and the idea was uh, in 61 seconds, create your own video about why you're concerned with this piece of legislation. And we had some musicians and a privacy commissioner and some other well-known personalities serve as Judges, people started Twittering it, of course, it was still early days. And all of this was sufficiently effective that within about six weeks of this bill being introduced in the middle of summer, when most Canadians are at the cottage, and, or at least not paying attention to copyright, we had members of parliament hold town hall meetings in their communities, whether in Ontario, which was the Bruce Stant and the first fellow you saw there, or Souk Dhaliwal, a liberal MP at the time in Vancouver, who said that this was one of the top issues that they were hearing from their constituents all summer long, such that they said, well, let's have a town hall meeting and let's discuss these kinds of issues. As I say, the bill ultimately comes back, uh, but again, that power to rally and engage people uh, was clearly there. They, at the end of the day, the government actually, a year later, um, it, the bill died and they held a national copyright consultation when more people participated in that consultation than virtually any other um, that we've seen in recent years in Canada. More than 8,000 people taking the time to actually write their views on what the government ought to do with respect to copyright, and suddenly the engagement is now a bit two-way. And so when, 
one of the last bills, copyright bills, was introduced in Canada. The, the new minister at the time, Tony Clement, uh, took to Twitter to directly answer questions from, from Canadians within hours of the bill having been introduced. He's a particularly active Twitter user, so it's not typical of most government ministers. But in this, one, in this particular case, he literally stood, uh, st uh, stood off from the podium uh, at the press conference and within about two to three hours was responding to some of the queries that people were posting directly at him via Twitter. And unsurprisingly, what we have seen now in Canada is that the same tools that are being were used by those opposed to the legislation are being, of course, used by those in favor of it. So I talked about fair copyright for Canada as being our group. These shiny, happy people here uh, are supporting balanced copyright for Canada, which is a group that was established by the recording industry, uh, arguing that this legislation is actually very balanced and ought to be supported. We see the same Facebook use now being used by those that are uh, on the other side. In some instances, it's a writer's group opposed uh, to some of the fair dealing, which would be Canada's version of fair use reforms. Others using the other sorts of tools, again, to encourage people to get engaged. And so one of, I think, the most obvious first lessons that, that we'll see post-SOPA is that the same tools that were used by uh, those opposed to SOPA the next time round will be used far more aggressively by the Motion Picture Association and by other groups who are in favor of SOPA this time trying to use those same kinds of mechanisms and tools to rally support for what they're doing. So I think it's quite clear that there is, as they say, something happening here. We see it not just in the United States, but we are seeing it in countries around the world. Now, if I'm going to talk about what's happening here beyond SOPA, uh, I think that there are two things. One, as I said, was this disruptive internet. Uh, and I think we can see how it disrupts not just some of the substantive copyright rules, but disrupts the way in which many of these rules are established and the demands that many people have for being more active participants um, in that political and policy process. But beyond that, there's international copyright. And there is something big happening here as well, uh, not just in the attempt to use SOPA to influence what takes place in other countries, but to use that international process to influence what takes place legislatively in those countries, as well as, as Kenny mentioned, here in the United States as well, where in some instances the ability to uh, enact certain rules may be constrained by what's taking place uh, internationally, and that is no accident, that is actually by design. Now, when we talk about international copyright, there's a tendency to talk about things like various conventions, the Berne Convention, the Rome Convention. I'm not going to get into the specifics of that. Much of that has coalesced around WIPO, which is the World Intellectual Property Organization. It's a UN, one of the UN-based agencies uh, located in Geneva, and it's where many of the discussions for many years have started to take place. Now, I would argue that the, what we see happening today has its origins, I mean, we can go back many points in time, but I'm going to actually pick as my date or my timeline, 1996. Because a couple of things happened in 1996. One in January of 1996, uh, a couple of graduate students at Stanford start a search project that ultimately becomes Google, um, highlighting how fast things have changed in terms of, of our reliance on all, all of that. So when Sergey Brin had his, literally his home page, which is still on the internet, um, as a grad student at Stanford, one could scarcely imagine that Google would become what Google has become. Uh, and that took place in 1996. But what also took place in 1996 were a pair of treaties, WCT and WPPT, uh, better known as the Internet Treaties for White Bowl. And the Internet Treaties contain a number of different provisions, but the one that is most directly targeted to the digital environment and the online environment or what's known as anti-circumvention rules, more commonly by many referred to as digital lock rules. And the, the idea behind these anti-circumvention rules is essentially to create a new layer of protection in the digital environment. And so Kenny went through many of the protections that exist within the statute. Uh, that provides, of course, a first layer of protection. And for that's, that would be true in virtually every country around the world. We have a Copyright Act in Canada, and many of the same provisions that you see in the United States exist within Canada. And so, as Kenny mentioned, we are all copyright owners, creators ourselves in, in some capacity, and, and copyright law provides us with that first layer of protection. By the mid-90s, it became clear that there might be another layer of protection, particularly or specifically for works in digital form because we could use digital rights management or technological protection measures, various digital lock tools, 
to make it difficult from a technical perspective for someone to access, to access works or to use works in certain ways. So the statute may say you've got a right, let's say, under fair use or otherwise to use a particular work, but if I distribute my work in digital form and I use one of these technological restrictions to physically, in a sense, stop you from copying the work or making use of this work, uh, that's, in a sense, another layer of protection. Think, for example, of DVDs, which contain region coding. Um, you may or may not know this, then they contain region coding that are linked to particular DVD players. And so certainly here, if you pick up a DVD, play it in your local DVD player, it will work. But if you happen to go to Europe or Asia and pick up a DVD there, it's region coded specifically to Europe or to Asia. There's an Australian region. There are regions around the world. And if you bring it back to play in your local, in your home DVD player, it won't play. If you stick it in your computer and say you'd like it to play, it will actually tell you that this DVD is from another region. Would you like to switch the region on your computer? And they typically give you five attempts to switch regions, so you can say yes, um, but then you've got all those other DVD, DVDs that are back in your home region, so you may want to switch back again. Uh, by the fifth time, they say you are now locked into your region choice. So that's work that's protected. Those under the content in the DVD is ob obviously protected, by copyright, but this provides another technological tools, a technological measure to protect it as well. Now what these treaties sought to do was provide actually a third layer of protection on top of the technology. Because even in the mid-90s there was a recognition that if one, one could include these kinds of technological tools, but there was a recognition they could easily be circumvented or broken. There was no digital lock that can't be broken, it would seem. And so the idea was to provide legal protection not for the work, but for the lock itself, for the technology itself. And the idea being that any attempt to circumvent or get around the digital lock would itself become an infringement. So you could infringe certainly if you use the work uh, in an infringing way, but this is an infringement if you try to get around the lock itself. Now, of course, this raises the question, what if your intended use of the work is fair? Let's say it's permitted by fair use, or in my country, fair dealing. And as we'll see in a sec, the way it's been implemented in a number of countries is to say, sorry, but you're out of luck. The mere act of circumventing, even if your intended use is fair, is permitted, is still an act of infringement. Now, note that back in the mid-1990s, this was highly controversial. So it was in the mid-1990s that we had a diplomatic conference to settle on this, and the countries themselves had a very hard time coming up with language that everyone could agree on. At the end of the day, what I've just described actually gets enacted in the treaty is this. You've got to provide adequate legal protection and effective legal remedies against the circumvention of effective technological measures. Well, what are adequate legal protections and effective legal remedies? Depends who you ask. Uh, for countries around the world, they all have different interpretations of what that means. And in fact, if we go back to the legislative history of how this evolved, it's clear that that was true from the very beginning as through a series of different meetings that took place at the World Intellectual Property Organization, various countries had discomfort with this entire approach and real concerns about what this might evolve into. So if we go back even to 94, the US is the first or one of the first to raise this idea of providing legal protection for copy protection systems, but there was no specific language proposed. They were actually were focused more on the devices as to the content itself. As the meetings begin to uh, unfold, the U.S. is talking about how urgent all of this is, and countries begin to express concern. You could see South Korea from the very beginning saying, isn't this going to uh, have an effect on the normal exploitation of the work? What well, we just had described earlier, this idea that uh, once you've sold it, I get to do certain things with this, uh, and the copyright owner is increasingly out of the picture. Um, but this, and so Korea recognized that that would have an impact. In fact, as the meetings continue, more and more start talking about the need for flexible implementation or mandatory exceptions, because this is going to create some real problems. And this happens over and over again. And as this begins to coalesce around specific language, countries around the world start saying, hold on a second, I'm not so comfortable with this. Yet by December, despite the lack of comfort with it, the, those behind it are able to convene a diplomatic conference on the issue in December of of 1996, and once again, many delegations say, based on fairly restrictive language, similar to what you find today in the United States under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, that they simply can't agree with 
the approach. And so lots of concern at the conference, at a plenary conference as well. If you take a look back at the records, you find that most countries had problems with very strict interpretations of these rules. So after all of that, what happens? Well, this is what happens. <laughs> the best way to address in a consensus-based organization one where you have a very hard time coming up with rules that everyone can agree on is to come up with language that is so general in nature that everyone can agree to it because it means something slightly different to just about everybody. Now in the years that unfolded after that, what you found was different implementation. So in the United States, the implementation is, the, is through the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the DMCA. It's amongst the most restrictive in the world because the U.S. initially wanted a restrictive approach. It couldn't get agreement to do that at Geneva, but came back to the United States and said, first off, we have an obligation now to create these new legal protections because there's this international treaty that says we have to have that, and this ought to be our implementation. Uh, other countries either adopted a different approach. In Canada, we've had now four different bills attempt to implement it. We've got one, C11 is the current one that is likely to pass sometime this year. Other countries so adopted one approach and then later were pressured into a different approach. Australia, for example, adopted initially a very flexible approach and then a couple of years later entered into negotiations with the United States on a U.S.-Australia free trade agreement. And as part of that free trade agreement, the U.S. insisted that Australia adopt the U.S. style approach. And so Australia now has a DMCA style approach uh, as a result of that trade agreement. But I think the experience in WIPO um, in some ways represents the high watermark for the uh, for moving forward with these sorts of protections, even where there really isn't true consensus. But it represented for those that had long used WIPO as the main place to engage in these activities, a bit of a wake-up call that things were beginning to change. And so this, I think, foreshadows what has become this global battle over copyright. Now at WIPO, things have started to change in the years since then. In the world since the internet treaties, a couple of notable things have happened. First, um, WIPO itself has become far more open. Uh, so using the tools that we talked about from sort of the internet disruption segment of what I was referring to, at WIPO 2, what was once a relatively closed entity, closed organization such that it was just government delegations that by and large were allowed to appear, uh, suddenly now you had many NGOs beginning to go to Geneva for these various meetings and they weren't content to just sit in the room. They would blog about it, they now tweet about it, uh, they would try to raise as much global awareness of this as possible and they would increasingly actively work with many of the developing countries who are also at WIPO uh, to ensure that their interests were better represented uh, as those delegations became better educated about some of those issues. So for one thing, as WIPO became more open, uh, it became subject to far more scrutiny about what was taking place such that uh, many of the kinds of things that would have taken place a decade earlier in terms of the ability to push forward with certain reforms became far more difficult. In fact, one of the big success stories over the last, last number of years at WIPO is what's referred to as the development agenda. The notion that if you're going to move forward with intellectual property rules globally, it can't just be about ratcheting up and creating new kinds of rights. It also has to take into account limitations and exceptions. It has to take into account the concerns of all the members of WIPO, including the many countries from the developing world. And what we've seen come out of that development agenda are a number of different treaty proposals. The one that is closest to fruition is what's known as the TVI, the Treaty for the Visually Impaired, um, which was, not, I think, a, a good starting point because uh, that community, the visually impaired community, of course, for them, uh, restrictions are at the heart of, of, of ensure that there is no access. If you use these technological restrictions, if you use legal rules to stop someone from having access. If you have restrictions within the more general copyright law that prohibit against the transformation of a work into a format that is more readily accessible for someone who is visually impaired, they simply don't have any access at all. And so we are moving closer to creating mandatory requirements with respect to uh, protections or limitations and exceptions for the visually impaired. Next on the agenda and also now on a matter for discussion is a library treaty where the library community is working towards arguments about for this, that particular community, here are the kinds of limitations and exceptions that we think ought to be universally available. 
The difference between having an individual country in a code, such as we saw earlier, say, here are a series of different one-off exceptions that we're going to create. Those can work well in one community, but they are not universally adopted. And the notion of trying to move forward with a broader treaty is to try to ensure that everybody enjoys access to those kinds of uh, limitations and exceptions as well. So WIPO has changed. And, so for, and those looking for an increasing amount of protections, that is a frustrating um, sort of set of circumstances. They're unhappy that WIPO has changed some of the dialogue, that it is more open. And so I would argue that those that want to see SOPA-like legislation have, in some ways, taken their ball and gone to play elsewhere, employing three main strategies. And that's what I want to, for the last few minutes of the talk, that's where I want to focus on. The first strategy is an extraterritorial strategy, an attempt to try to take laws, typically from the United States, but in some instances from Europe as well, and apply them elsewhere. Now, SOPA would be the most obvious example of that, an attempt to say, here are our rules. We're going to either adopt a very aggressive jurisdictional position, a position that says, uh, merely, as I mentioned, because a domain name, a .com domain, let's say, is registered in the United, has its registry in the United States, we can assert jurisdiction over it. It actually goes further. It would say that any domain name or any site that, where there is no jurisdiction, a court can use what's known as in rem jurisdiction um, to assert jurisdiction over the site, even though in, other circ in any other circumstance the court wouldn't be able to assert jurisdiction. So SOPA very actively trying to assert U.S. jurisdiction in that particular case against sites around the world. But it's, this in some ways isn't particularly new either. About 10 years ago, just over 10 years ago now, a Russian programmer by the, nom the name of Dmitry Skylarov, who worked for a Russian software company known as Elkomsoft, went to a conference in the United States uh, to present on one of the programs that his company was working on that would actually circumvent some of the digital locks on some Adobe products. Um, and so, of course, PDF and some of the other Adobe products widely used and can be used to create restrictions. This was designed to allow people to circumvent some of those restrictions. And of course, in some instances, that might be used for perfectly legitimate purposes, fair use or otherwise. Skylarov steps off the stage at the conference and is arrest arrested by federal marshals and spends the summer in jail away from his wife and children um, uh, for this uh, alleged copyright infringement, or at least uh, that, was the, that was the particular program uh, that his company was promoting. Adobe, I don't think, anticipated that would take place. You can see through that sort of small picture that people have been taking to the streets on some of these issues for some time now, not just yesterday in Poland where people actively said you needed to free this poor fellow. Uh, which they ultimately did, Adobe actually quickly said, this is not what we had in mind when we referred this to um, federal officials, uh, but nevertheless highlights that ability. But in that instance, he's at least in the United States. In other instances now, you don't have to necessarily be in the United States. This teenager here um, ran a website known as TV Shack, which uh, clearly in an infringing basis streamed uh, television shows online. He is now due to be extradited to the United States. Uh, from the UK. You can see his mother in the background isn't too happy about it. Um, and, the U and a recent UK court decision said that he could in fact be extradited uh, to the US to face US justice and US copyright laws, even though he's located in the UK. And then most recently, um, in just the day after the protest or two days after the protests um, with respect to SOPA, um, one, of the more, one of the more popular so-called cyber lockers known as Mega Upload uh, was taken down. This is, if you go to the mega upload site, this is what you now see, uh, as the site has been seized by the FBI. Um, and the people behind it uh, are, are now in jail. And in fact, the main person behind it was not granted bail by a New Zealand court, uh, highlighting how global this has become. There were more than a dozen countries that participated in the takedown of mega upload, seizing assets uh, and arresting individuals in countries around the world. Um, so a truly global operation highlighting that uh, even where the individuals may not be located in the jurisdiction, taking local rules and seeking to apply them on an extraterritorial basis is one approach that can work fairly well. The other approach is to, and the second approach is to forum shop. So that if Whitebo didn't work very well, let's find another place that will. And we see that happening in a couple of different ways. One is to actually involve a growing number of international organizations. So this sort of alphabet soup of the World Trade Organization, the WTO, the World Health Organization, the WHO, the World Customs Union, the WCU, and it goes on and on and on, 
are all now actively engaged in inter international intellectual property enforcement and policy making. The idea that you now just go to WIPO in Geneva to talk about these IP rules has changed dramatically to the point that the WCU starts talking about powers that customs officials ought to have for seizure and for inspection of goods as they um, cross, the, cross, cross boundaries. The WHO, of course, dealing with counterfeit issues and the very contentious issue uh, of medicines, some of which may be counterfeit, but some of which may be perfectly legit medicines, uh, whether generic or otherwise, in their own locale, um, but the patent holder or the rights holder seeks to stop its distribution in, in other countries. So one is to begin to look to other international organizations beyond WIPO. The other, and this, as I mentioned off the top, the subject of the protests in the, in the streets of Poland yesterday, is to create entirely new organizations. And I want to spend at least a couple longer minutes talking about ACTA, the Anti-Counterfeiting Trade Agreement, because it is illustrative not only of that strategy, but of a strategy that, if successful, and it at this stage I think shows every indication of being successful, I think will be replicated in a number of different, in many other circumstances. ACTA is referred to as a plurilateral agreement as opposed to a multinational agreement. And uh, it's described by some as sort of a coalition of the willing. The idea was identify a number of countries who might be like-minded on issues with respect to uh, counterfeiting, copyright, trademark related issues, and perhaps they could quickly establish a single agreement to establish a higher threshold than exists at international law. It turned out even that was far more difficult than its proponents thought. So this actually began as an idea back in 2004 when people started talking, could we come up with a treaty on this, uh, although rarely in the public fora. It goes to 2006. In 2007, they announced there is an announcement of, amongst a series of countries, Canada, the EU, Australia, obviously the United States, New Zealand, and others about the need to, the desire to move forward with some negotiations on this treaty. And then over a several year period, in 2008, 2009, and 10, you get a whole series of meetings. What was initially thought to be just a, a six to 12 month process. In fact, uh, this starts under the Bush administration and there were those that thought this would conclude before Bush left office. But yet it took several years to even on an issue where people all agree with the general notion of ensuring that uh, we have appropriate rules to deal with counterfeiting. Yet once you get more granular and into the details of what those rules ought to be, you quickly find that there are many different perspectives on what some of those rules should be. So anyway, uh, many, many meetings, uh, an evolution of all of this, such that an agreement is finally agreed to just over a year ago, signed by many countries uh, back in September of last year, signed by most, though not all, European Union countries yesterday. Uh, there are still a series of holdouts in that regard. It, the treaty still will take some time. It hasn't been approved yet uh, by the European Parliament. Uh, and then signing a treaty doesn't mean that it is ratified and implemented yet. Now, why the concern over the treaty? Let me tell you just a little bit about it, if it's, a, if it's new to you. Uh, the treaty contains several different chapters. The one that attracted always the most amount of attention was the enforcement of IPR chapter, naturally enough, which was broken down into several sections. Uh, civil enforcement, border measures, criminal enforcement, and the internet provisions. Concerns around this issue focused on focus on several different uh, areas, the transparency and the like, and I'll, I'll get into each of these quickly in just a sec. I'll start first though with transparency. And the transparency issue was I think for many, uh, for a very long time, by far the biggest concern. Because all of this was taking place in secret for many years. The, the press, certainly the preparatory, meet, preparatory work behind this was conducted in secret. But beyond even the preparatory work, what we found was as the negotiations began to unfold, as there were proposed language for all of this, uh, that too was kept secret. Um, happily, from my perspective, and I participated in doing some of this, uh, there were leaks, and so I leaked some of the, I leaked some of the chapters. Other people uh, who got a hold of it leaked some of the chapters as well, so that at least people were aware of what was taking place, because what we have seen, of course, since the treaty was concluded, is that the time to oppose and raise concerns about the substance of the treaty is while it is being negotiated. Uh, once it has been negotiated and agreed to, it's almost impossible to undo those substantive provisions. If it all happens in secret, there is no real public input or opportunity to raise concerns. And so it took a very long time to get to this point. It was only uh, in 2010 that a draft version was finally released. Um, it confirmed that the leaks were, in fact, accurate leaks. 
Um, but it was striking to see how even that unfolded, where, for example, the United States, in the run-up to the meeting, the U.S., it turns out, was the one holdup uh, of all the countries in terms of not wanting to release. All other countries wanted to. Um, sought to use that as a bargaining chip as part of the negotiations, uh, arguing that if other countries caved on some other issues, they'd be more willing to cave on the transparency issue. Um, and so to use this as a substantive bargaining chip um, was, I think, striking for many. Indeed, the, one of some of the WikiLeaks cables that were released highlight how various countries were indeed concerned and, and of the view that this was not standard or normal by any stretch of the imagination. This one here from Italy in 2008, where, where you can see, according to some Italian officials, they note that the level of confidentiality in the negotiations is higher than has been set um, uh, for an agreement that is customary for a non-security arrangement. In fact, when chapters were being sent to uh, various embassies or countries around the world, proposed draft texts, you had to visit the U.S. Embassy to get it, uh, not me, uh, government officials, would visit uh, in a paper form with that level of security. It was, it was as if this was akin to nuclear secrets or something when we're just talking about a copyright treaty. Um, and people note from the beginning that the idea of having true consultation with the public on an agreement that isn't publicly available is an absolute non-starter. You simply can't do that. And so it's not the norm, and yet the worry is it will become the norm, because that was the starting approach, and it, that lack of transparency is still defended by those who were behind ACTA now that that agreement is passed. So we worry whether or not that will become indeed standard. It is also, I think, described by some as a country club approach to treaty making. At WIPO, it's consensus-based. You've got over 100, 150 countries all participating. This has 40-odd, although 30 of those represented by a single entity the, the, at, by the European Union. And the fear is that just as the developing world in particular, the library community, the, the community from the visually impaired, are beginning to make headway at WIPO, we start to see the development agenda and other of those initiatives undermined by the move to ACTA. Because for countries like the United States and for the European Union, the two big backers behind ACTA, if their primary concern are ACTA-like provisions, what incentives do they have to reach consensus on things like a library treaty or a treaty for the visually impaired if they're getting what they want in an ACTA format uh, as opposed to having to negotiate this uh, as would conventionally be the case at WIPO. In fact, the developing world started raising concerns at the World Trade Organization as well, expressing fears that this was going to undermine many of the international trade agreements that exist at the WTO. Uh, and that strategy of exclusion, I should note, was by design from the very beginning. Another WikiLeaks uh, document back when this was just beginning in 2006, uh, where this is from the government of Japan, which was actively working with the U.S. on this, they identified a first tranche of countries who they said ought to participate, those that uh, might be seen as being less opposed to some of the proposals, and then perhaps a second approach, second tranche a little bit later on. My own country was seen as coming later. And that exclusion, of course, means that all the countries that are supposedly the source of most counterfeiting products, you can see, are all excluded from this. It's a counterfeiting treaty without the counterfeiters. Uh, and so the idea that you can significantly deal with uh, counterfeiting problems on a global level and exclude the countries that are typically reputed to be prime sources of counterfeit product, say like China or um, Russia, the Ukraine and others, who have all been expressly excluded, um, suggest that this is not designed to work in a serious way at a global level at all. From a substance perspective, there were at times very serious concerns. And this actually highlights the importance of demanding transparency when it comes to these kinds of agreements. Because based on some of the early leaks, there were real fears of things like iPod searching border guards, the three strikes and you're out that could lead to termination, um, to termination of people's internet access, statutory damages on a global basis. In the United States, statutory damages may be seen as the standard of up to $150,000 per infringement. I assure you it is not. The overwhelming majority of the world has no statutory damages. When it comes to copyright infringement, you have to prove your actual damages, yet this was designed to try to um, ensure that that was a requirement. There was dealing with things like in-transit shipments, um, let's say pharmaceutical products going from one country on their way from India, let's say on their way to Brazil, yet on their way there would be a, the ship would stop in the Netherlands, uh, and there have been instances where those products have been seized uh, by Dutch authorities, even though they're not aimed for the Dutch market, uh, arguing that there is patent infringement, even though what we're typically talking about are legit products, um, but generics uh, because the patent may have expired or there may be no patent 
uh, in the country of source or nor the country of destination. The good news is most of that has been eliminated. Things like three strikes once there was public, uh, public outcry on this was taken out, highlighting how the public, even in this situation where they were deliberately excluded, had the ability to try to speak out and try to ensure that this didn't happen. Yet there remain many concerns. Expansion of international treaty rules, moving the standard from what was agreed to by consensus to a far higher consensus or to far higher levels of protection creating new customs, new criminal pro new customs powers, new criminal provisions, and the like. This is, in a sense, rewriting international treaties. So if we look at things like WIPO that was agreed to on the digital lock provisions that I talked about earlier, ACTA actually seeks to build on that and make mandatory what they couldn't agree to back in the mid-90s. It is, in a sense, a renegotiation of the very treaties that were based on consensus at that point in time, but excluding the very parties who were part of the negotiation to begin with. There are in many countries, including this one, concerns from a constitutional perspective. Because the approach from the US government at the moment is to say that there is no need for congressional uh, approval of this. This is simply implementing a basic trade agreement. Um, and so the executive branch would like to simply say that we're, we're, we're in there in a position to pass it with no further uh, review or oversight. A number of senators and others have raised questions about whether or not that passes constitutional muster. The same is true in the European Union where the negotiators were limited to what's known as the EU acquis, the, the body of European Union law. And the argument is that this extends beyond that and that negotiators were not empowered to go beyond that in the way that they did. Most fundamentally, it represents, I think, a reframing of the issue. And I spent more time on this um, than some of the other areas, in part because I want to emphasize that it is ACTA not, is not the end of this, but in some ways the beginning, in fact, the one treaty that's worthy of particular attention is the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Negotiations, of which the U.S. is um, a participant, along with nine Asian uh, countries, or including the United States, there are nine countries right now, Australia, New Zealand, Vietnam, uh, Malaysia, and some others, uh, Chile and, and Peru, this is all based on the Pacific, and there's most recently been attempts by Canada, Japan, and Mexico to join those negotiations. Uh, those negotiations are, of course, also secret. And so as it turns out, all of it, all, virtually the entire agreement has not been made public. The one exception to that is the intellectual property uh, proposal has leaked. Uh, and uh, it turns out that the IP chapter uh, is ACTA plus. It's basically what the attempt to try to get in ACTA, um, but once there was some public outcry on this, they were unable to achieve an ACTA and are now instead trying to push this forward within the TPP. And it's even more than just ACTA. Uh, Kenny was mentioning the public domain and how important that is. The U.S. has a term of protection of life of the author plus 70 years. The Berne Convention requires countries to have no more than life of the author plus 50 years. That's the term of protection in Canada. It's the term of protection in Japan, um, in New Zealand, a number of the TPP or proposed TPP countries. And yet one of the requirements in the TPP would be to extend the term of copyright. Um, the effect certainly has been felt in the United States of having nothing enter into the public domain. And we see it happen every year in Canada. Whereas an example this year in Europe, they were talking about how James Joyce, Joyce's works finally entered into the public domain this year. His works have been in the public domain in Canada for 20 years. Um, this year in Canada, Ernest Hemingway entered into the public domain. Uh, William Faulkner, I believe, enters uh, next year or two. It's amazing to see the number of um, works that enter into the public domain when you adhere to international standards as opposed to go beyond that, and yet the TPP has an expectation that all countries will move beyond that, the effect being in a country like my own, of uh, putting a freeze on anything new entering into the public domain literally for 20 years. Uh, the impact is enormous. Finally, uh, I talked about extraterritorial approaches, about using new treaties. The third is domestic reform. And I think here not of domestic reform in the United States, but rather domestic reform in other countries. Um, the most obvious way that this takes place is through what's known as the USTR Special 301 report, which is an annual report that the US Trade Representatives um, releases talking about which countries it believes have substandard intellectual property protection, and this is used as a mechanism to try to pressure those countries to change those domestic laws. The mo on the, in the most recent report from the USTR, which I should note excludes most sub-Saharan African 
uh, countries. Over 70% of the world's population are said to live under substandard IP laws. I live in one of those countries. Um, and, but, but the truth of the matter is that all, it seems that we feel like we're in, many of us feel like we're in good company. Because uh, I say seemingly just about everybody, if you listen to the USTR somehow, uh, doesn't have uh, the kind of protections that are, that are necessary. And so what you find is this is used as a tool to pressure domestic governments uh, to make changes. Thankfully, many governments have recognized the report for what it is. This is what one Canadian official told a Canadian um, a Congress, it's a House of Commons hearing, like a congressional hearing, where they noted that in regard to the watch list, Canada doesn't recognize the watch list process, recognizing that it lacks reliable uh, and objective analysis driven largely by U.S. industry. I think that's true, but I also think the kind of press that it generates um, and the concerns on the mon uh, amongst elected politicians who see this pressure, who when they meet with the U.S. ambassador or with other officials, are made aware of uh, these rankings or these reports uh, clearly has an impact on what domestic reform looks like in Canada and, in, frankly, in countries around the world. We see it again through the WikiLeaks uh, cables where many of the cables talk specifically about uh, the Special 301 report. And to show just how unscientific it all is, when you go through the various cables, you see its officials simply looking at what level of, of pressure they think will be effective. It's not really about what the country's laws actually look like. Um, it's rather about uh, what, whether they go on the list, what level they go on the list, is almost entirely dependent upon um, how local officials, embassy officials, think this will play domestically. So it's not a genuine look at anything. It's simply a matter uh, of political action. And I should note that SOPA envisioned more of the same. In fact, this provision got far less attention in the United States than it did in, in countries outside the U.S. But one of SOPA's requirements was to specifically link international trade policy with IP policy. And so you can see here that from a policy perspective, Secretary of State and others shall ensure the protection in foreign countries of IP rights is a significant component of U.S. foreign and commercial policy in general uh, and in relation to individual countries in particular. It goes on uh, to dedicate specific resources to ensure that U.S. embassies and consulates around the world have specific resources to ensure that they can effectively lobby and pressure domestic governments to change their rules when it comes to uh, their intellectual property rules. That's directly within SOPA. Um, so if we're talking about beyond SOPA, in many ways, I think uh, this is what that is. SOPA is neither the beginning nor the end of this process. We can see that it has been going on for a number of years now, and I think is very likely to continue. There were many that described last Wednesday as the, the day that the internet fought back, um, the day when millions of people uh, saw what was taking place, became aware of it, and began to ensure that their voices were heard. Um, if I have a message about what I think is likely to take place beyond SOPA, it's that we're going to have to keep fighting. Thanks very much for your attention.